Absolutely. Well, great. Hello, iPhone. I don't know who it was that just joined. We're going to get started here just to give a high level overview of what's going on. So of course, my name is Dawn Bennett. I'm a relationship coach. I've been working in the healing field for 26 years now. I work mainly with emotions. So even though my title is coach, really what I do is I help find the emotional basis around challenges in relationships and lack thereof. Hi, Mary. Hi there. Hey. Cool. Yeah. So what we're going to do today, just a high level overview, is we're going to talk about dating. We're going to have you do a couple of exercises to really delve into what it is that you're looking for and want in your dating relationship life. Um, I'll have some PowerPoints on and off and all that kind of stuff. You can ask questions at any point in time. Just know that your um, voice will be recorded. However, your video should not be. I'll edit all that out if something does happen where it pops up. And at the end, I will shut off the recording so that way it's only, you know, if you have any questions that you don't want to go up for people that need to watch it later, you don't have to worry about being exposed. So if you have something a little bit more delicate, we can do that at the end. All right. Are we ready? Yes. Sweet. Yes. There we go. Okay. So here's the biggest problem that I see is most of us don't know what it is that we're looking for. And what? historically, this is how mate selection happened, like in the past. It was very traditional. It was based on socioeconomic classes. So what was really great about that is you got a lot of support, right? You had friends hooking you up. You had family members hooking you up. Sometimes there was organized marriages based upon status or based upon stature or who someone thought would lift somebody up or be able to support families within each other. The nice part about that as well is there was a behavioral pre-screening. In other words, like they weren't gonna hook you up with a murderer or they weren't gonna hook you up with someone that probably wasn't going to suit. However, there was a limited freedom of choice. But see, we only had the opportunity to meet and to date a small number of people, especially compared to now. And so what's changed about that is now we're following this, like what we call the Hollywood model of mate selection. We're taught that it needs to be super romantic and there's got to be chemistry and connection right away. And so we're taught now to look at someone immediately. Do I swipe left? Do I swipe right? Are they cute? Are they attractive? Do I want to whatever? And so we're taught right away that there should be this mystery, this intrigue, which already creates this level of superficiality and dishonesty within the first part of dating. The disadvantage with that is you get no support, right? And there's no behavioral pre-screening. You're kind of figuring it out as you go because you met somebody, like maybe you met someone still at church or at a bar or out at an event, but you're still only getting that little snapshot of them. Now, the key advantage of that is you have like so much choice that it's unbelievable, right? Now, the interesting thing that I think you should be aware of is that our brain only has a certain capacity to meet a certain amount of people, to process a certain amount of information. And today we're online working, we're watching videos, we're seeing all of these social media things. Or even if we don't do that, we're driving along and there's these flashy billboards, right? There's so much information. We get our texts, we get our emails, we get phone calls. We have these videos popping up. Whatever it is on our phone, we're constantly inundated with data, which overwhelms our mind. So our brain does not know the difference between reality and imagination. Now, the good part of that is that where everybody starts manifesting, right? You picture yourself in your perfect relationship. You really feel what you'd feel, hear what you'd hear. And you really imagine that and it sets this energy, this tone for what you're creating. It gives you something to look forward to. What's not so good about it is we can also start telling ourselves stories about what's true or what's not true in our life. 
Oh, the town's too small. Oh, there's no good people out there. Oh, this is, um, people are hard to date. Also, when we're looking at dating people online, I mean, have you ever sat in your house and chatted with a few people online and then just been exhausted and you never end up meeting a lot of these people and they ghost you or they go away or something just, it, you waste a lot of time and energy towards this. But your brain thinks that you've talked to these hundreds of people or 20 people or 50 people and our capacity to hold energy in these multiple relationships is so diminished because even though you've just been texting or chatting online with a certain amount of people, your brain can only support so much at a time. And so it becomes easy to get overwhelmed. It becomes easy to actually isolate ourselves, but also to rely on these interactions in a way that doesn't create the connection that we desire because we're not making that true energetic connection. We're not finding the true reality. So that's when we start looking at, oh, I go online. What do they look like? What do they write in their profile? Are they the right political thing? Or do they live close enough? Or whatever it is that we think we're looking for, we make immediate snap judgments. Now there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, we want to follow our gut instinct, but our gut instinct, not our brain instinct. And have you ever noticed that someone, you can meet somebody out and they may be kind and they may be attractive, but then you're taught that like, well, that's boring because of the Hollywood model. Well, they're not very exciting. This is boring. I'm not really engaged with them. Nah, I'm just going to move on. Or there's a lot of research showing that when you've been communicating with someone for a month, if there's been no personal interaction, meaning face-to-face, -face, that's most often when the hormonal shifts happen in our mind, like the actual dopamine rushes, the connection of hormonal engagement. And that's when we get ghosted or we forget who it was we're talking to because there's no true deeper connection. So what we wanna to do today is look at how does dating fit in our life? Who do we want to fit into our life? What does that look like and feel like? How do we identify that? Rather than saying, okay, well, how could I squish them in? Are they gonna take good care of my kids? But how are, they, how are we actually gonna create synergy and how are we gonna support each other in life? So often what we find is that people are wasting a lot of time, money, and energy because we're not clear. We're not truly clear on what it is that we want in somebody else. And there's all these societal stories, right? So sometimes women were taught that we need this strong man, but he's kind of got to be a little bad boyish, maybe or they have to be really structured so we protect ourselves. Or if they're too aggressive, we have to back away. Or now the big, the big thing is like, oh, you gotta be a boss bitch, right? I don't need a man in my life. I can do everything myself. And how dare a man come in and say they're gonna help me or support me because I don't need that. And all of this is a protective mechanism. And then here's men out there Try, they're taught to hold a relationship, to help support a woman, to be a provider. And we're saying, mm, we don't need you. We want you to be exciting. We want you to be strong. Oh, we want you to show emotion, but not too much emotion, right? You got to make money, but not, but you know, you can't downgrade me by saying that you're going to support me, right? So there's all these like interesting energies that society is teaching us. And it's different generation by generation, yet still it seeps through our whole culture and it creates this disconnect, right? And the challenge I hear with a lot of people online, especially men, is they'll say, oh, they get a hard time having a woman say yes, like let's connect because there's this lack of trust or this lack of connection. And women are on guard or they're looking for this certain thing 
right? So what's happening now is we are going through what we call this stage of like confirmation bias. So confirmation bias is when you see one thing and then it keeps showing up in your life. Like for example, a good example of confirmation bias is you decide that you're gonna buy a red Honda cause you see gray Hondas everywhere, but there's no red Hondas. So you buy a red Honda and all of a sudden everywhere you look, there are not only red cars, but red Hondas. And you're surprised by the number of red cars and red Hondas that are out there. It's just because we've attuned our brain to look at something. So what's happening with dating, the dating scene is many of us have been disappointed, let down, betrayed, ghosted, overlooked, bad-mouthed. We've had pain in past relationships, breakups, and our brain for our own safety is attuned to that. Where can I keep myself safe by avoiding this? So we start believing there's no good people left out there. There's no one right for me. I'm not in the right spot, right? I have to be something different because that's what we keep seeing and that's what people keep telling us. But then we also have something called belief perseverance. So belief perseverance is when despite other evidence, we still keep seeing the same thing over and over. So let me give you an example. When I was in my mid twenties, I went out with a bunch of girlfriends. I'd been in class all day. So I was in like jeans and a tank top and whatever, like no makeup. I didn't care. Like I wasn't a very makeup kind of girl anyway, really. Um, but we were all out at some fancy thing in downtown Minneapolis. And they all had on their heels and their fancy little dresses and their cute little things because they were going out to pick up guys like that was their purpose. And that's what they loved to do anyway, was actually to just dress up and look nice, even if they weren't picking up guys in particular. So while I was out with them, there was five of us. I was talking to this gentleman and, you know, he was dressed pretty casually and he complained to me for about 20 minutes about how none of those girls who are all dressed up and pretty would give him the time of day at all. Like, oh, they think they're so great and they're all dressed up and I'm not dressed nice enough. So they must think I'm not good enough for them. And he had this whole story in his head. And finally, at one point I looked at him and I said, you know, you're doing the same thing, right? Like these are my friends and you're basically telling me to my face that I'm not enough because I'm not dressed up in heels and address. So you don't even want to talk to me or date me except to whine about how they're not paying attention to you. <laughs> and this is what we do, right? As humans. And it becomes really so natural. Sometimes we don't even realize that we're doing it. So as we go through the rest of this class, I want you to kind of notice where is this, where are these patterns, these societal patterns and trainings and past relationships holding you back from actually finding what you want. Because what we find then is we start wasting other people's time by talking about like, oh, I can't find somebody or I'm dating this person, but I'm not sure if they're right. But what do you think? Maybe I should break up. Maybe I should try another date. I'm not sure. Which creates physical, mental, emotional stress. It can damage your self-esteem because you start not trusting not really knowing what you're looking for and how to identify it. And sometimes we stay in relationships too long. In fact, there's, there was some studies done that showed that most people knew within two weeks whether or not they should continue in a relationship. And women especially would last up to two years, either hoping the other person would change or just wanting someone to be around, which then loses us the opportunity to actually draw on the person that we like and we lose our quality of life. So what if you actually knew exactly what you want? Like the actual traits that you knew. So for example, I took this course called Learning to Find Love, which I'm now able to teach. It's a trademark class that was created by um, a woman who did uh, executive hiring for big businesses. And she would see what are the traits that we need to hire someone for the CEO position or for the CFO position or whatever. 
And she applied those same principles to this class to say, how do I know what traits I need in a partner to hire a long-term partner? Like, what do I need forever? Who should they be in the world? So we're looking past just the superficial, they're kind, they're nice. Like, yes, that's really important, but how do you know? How do you know that they're gonna be kind and nice forever? Like, that's more about how they're treating you and treating other people. What do you actually need? So for example, I thought I knew what I needed in a partner. I had a whole list, it was great. When I took the class and went through the process of that I'm gonna bring you through here in a minute, I found out that the top trait I needed in a partner was someone that was playful. Like that hadn't even crossed my mind as a trait that I should look for in somebody else. But it turned out to be the number one most important trait for me because I wanted someone that could joke around, that could play with my nephews, that didn't mind when I was like singing and dancing around the kitchen and who wanted to joke around but not be the class clown. Right? Who thought it was funny when I would like go run over to a playground and spin on the little tire spin swings? Because I love, I love spinning. It's like my favorite thing in the world, right? So <laughs> playful ended up being my top trait. And it was something I'd never looked for in a partner and never evaluated. So I'd get with these people and then I'd get bored with them. Right. Another trait that I needed is what a trait I called the man of the house, which to me meant that they saw what needed to be done and would do it. Because what would happen is if I was dating somebody and they couldn't see what was done, I'd, so I'd be like, hey, the sink needs to be fixed. Like, do you have time to do it? They'd say, sure, I have time to do it. And if they didn't do it, I'd just be like, never mind. And I'd do it myself. I would take over. And then I'd just be like, well, you don't do anything around here. I guess I just have to do it all. And then I would hold both the ma masculine energy and the feminine energy in the relationship. I'd lose my respect for them. I'd run them over and then I'd break up with them, right? So like none of these are healthy patterns, <laughs> but they're patterns that people tend to get into if they don't really know what they're looking for and how to find it before they enter into that relationship, okay? So yeah. one of the things that were taught in the Hollywood model, which I'm gonna jump back to here real quick, is hormones, right? We're taught in the Hollywood model, like, oh, they should be super attractive. You should feel that little, you know, thing in your stomach. You should like really want them and desire them in that lust stage. Lust is created by testosterone and estrogen, but this does not last forever, right? So we move through the lust stage. So as soon as that testosterone, that estrogen wears down, or if we're older in life and we don't have a lot of that present, what we need is that deeper attraction. And now when we're actually attracted to someone at a deeper level, it releases dopamine. It releases norepinephrine. We also called noradrenaline, right? Which is part of the hormonal system. And it releases serotonin. So now these chemicals help us create deeper bonds. But when true bonding happens, like the attachment style bonds, and I'm not talking about um, actual attachment, like healthy versus unhealthy attachment. But I'm talking about like when you actually fall in love, when you're actually in love in a deeper way with somebody, instead it releases oxytocin, which is a hormone that women release when they have babies. It's also called the cuddling hormone. It's released when we have touch with somebody and that can be touch like handshake, touch like a hand on a shoulder, non-sexual touch, as well as some sexual touch and vasopressin. So what happens for us as well as humans is we find somebody and we kind of like them and we stay for a couple of years and then we're like, mm, I'm not really that attracted to them anymore. Or we stay for a couple of months because it was more lust. The lust goes away, that's gone. Now, if we have attraction, we're at that second level. Usually that lasts about two years. So if you know people that have been in relationships that either break up or start having problems after two years, that's because this chemical has shifted inside of them. And so now we're relying on, are there these deeper hormones present? Do they have deeper connection? Then I don't want to say just something hormonal. I don't want to downgrade it like that. And where are they connected via the traits that they possess? 
via the loving consideration, in other words, how they treat each other, which then creates a deeper level of chemistry. That still triggers the lust part, but lust isn't first. Lust doesn't lead in the selection of a partner, right? Because when lust leads in the selection of a partner, as soon as those hormones go away, usually everything else goes away, right? Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is we want to know how do we actually compare these traits? How do we actually know what the traits are? So what we do often is we start going, well, I'm dating this person. And like, this one's really great because they're financially stable. And this one's really fantastic because they love to travel. And this one is so kind and funny. Like, I just really love how funny they are. But like, so we're not really comparing the same thing. So it's hard to say, like, do I want the person that's like really funny and kind? Or do I want the person that's really financially successful that I feel secure and safe with? Right? It's like kind of want them all. But that's because we're looking at the wrong thing. So when we're finding the actual traits that we need, we're comparing apples to apples. We're comparing all the same. So let's play with that for a minute. So get a pen and paper. And what you're going to do is I want you to think about your past relationships and think about like your past you know, strongest two to five relationships, like the longest term relationships that you had, if you've had that many, you know, for some of those watching the replay, maybe you haven't had a solid, strong relationship. So then maybe look at what do you see in movies or who do you admire that's been in a long-term relationship? But what are some of those qualities and traits that you really loved about that person or about that relationship? And by traits, I'm going to differentiate here, not how they treat you. How they treat you is different than a trait. So in other words, a trait or quality is something that they are in the world that they already have and will be forever. It's almost like their core value or their principles of who they are and how they show up. So maybe it's someone very intellectual and intelligent. But what does that look like for you? Because intellectual and intelligent for me might be someone that can talk quantum physics all day. Intellectual intelligent for someone else might be someone that's very um, well-versed in music or in books or can communicate politics really clearly or all of the above, right? So really not only understand what is the trait, but how do you know that that's the thing? If they're playful, what do you see? How do you know they're playful? What are they doing? How are they acting? How are they being in the world? So if you want someone that's, let's say, responsible, right? What does that look like? How do you know they're being responsible? Does that mean they show up on time? Does that mean they hold a job? Does that mean they're very well organized? Does that mean they take care of stuff around the house? Does that mean they were a good parent? Like, what does it mean? And when you have some of those down, you're going to have time afterwards. You can play with this forever. Then I want you to think about what didn't work in past relationships. Like what, what are the no-goes? The, oh my gosh, I will never date someone who, you know, jokes around all the time. I will never date someone who can't hold a job. I will never date someone who is disrespectful. I will never date someone who's always late. I will never date someone who can't communicate clearly or who gets angry um, at the flip of a coin or who is whatever. And 
the thing about the no-goes, the, the things that were really actually painful for us or the things that we found ourselves always nagging our significant other about, like, why aren't you like this? What's the opposite side of that? What's the positive flip of that coin? Because that's actually what you want. So for example, the way that I found I wanted someone that could take care of stuff around the house is I found myself complaining a lot about my past relationships of me having to do everything. But back then, part of me liked that. Like, I liked being like, I can do it all. I can have changed the oil in the car. I can fix a pipe. I can put a roof on the house. I know how to do all that stuff. But do I want to do that? Or do I want that in a partner? So if you had someone that perhaps didn't talk or talked too much, <laughs> What's the opposite of that? How do you identify like what it is that you truly want? Because this is going to kind of start your list of traits that you do want at a deep level. And then when I take people through the learning to find love course, we actually spend a whole hour on this going through it really, really specifically, because this is really key. Because there's a few things. A, we want to heal, do emotional, like emotional freedom techniques, tapping work, or we want to do something to clear resentments, hurts, angers from past relationships. Because otherwise we're going to get triggered in our new relationships or start projecting or start being fearful. But how would you see this out in the world? So when you're speed dating, when you're online, how would you be able to recognize that this person has this trait or doesn't have this trait? So for example, if one of your traits is they're a good family person, that may or may not be evident on their profile. But then when you're texting back and forth or when you're on your first phone call, you can say, hey, so tell me about the relationship you have with your family. And then you get to see, do they have that trait or not? Or are you getting some warning flags, right? So the first thing we want to evaluate when we're dating somebody is do they have the traits that I need? Now we usually narrow it down to the top five, right? Because the top five are really what's most important to us, like our really, really core values. We have our traits. We look at that first. Once we know a person has our traits, then we start looking at how are they treating us? And not like if they're treating us poorly, we just sit there and wait to see if they have the traits, right? But if they're, if they're kind, if they're um, giving or they're whatever it is that you need, and they have the traits, then you look at how much loving consideration do they have? And this also means communication on your part too, right? Like if you need a lot of affirmation and they're not natural at affirmation, but you say, hey, you know what? I really love receiving affirmations. And they make an effort to start doing that, right? Or are they doing the opposite of love and consideration? Are they giving little side jokes, making fun of you? talking you down, talking poorly about exes. You know, I mean, it's one thing to share like, hey, we're in a really honest communication about our past relationships and here's where my past relationship went wrong and it kind of sucked because that person, you know, did this or was whatever they were. But it's another thing to be like, oh, that, that when she did this and she did that and she was such a, you know, this, that, and the other, he was so awful and he was so mean and he was so manipulative. Like, well, were they that when you first started dating them and you didn't see it or you ignored it? Or did you allow resentments to build up over time because you expected something different that they didn't offer? And instead of choosing to end it when it was obvious it wasn't right, you kept 
going in the relationship, therefore creating anger, upset, upheaval within yourself and within the relationship, which causes conflict. Which then makes us go like, oh, see, I told you they're all like that. <laughs> oh, you didn't hold your boundaries. <laughs> you didn't break up when you knew it was time to break up. You didn't ask for what you wanted. Right? Or you were in there for something more superficial, which is okay. We've all been there. Right? We've all had moments where we've perhaps dated somebody that maybe wasn't right for us. We thought, well, they're kind of close. Maybe I'll give them another chance. Or we got a little red flag or a yellow flag that kind of made us go, hmm, well, maybe that was, maybe that was an error. We'll just have the benefit of the doubt, right? My instructor used to talk about this woman who um, had gone through the course. And one of the things she really needed was clear communication. So she went on the state with this guy. He was super great. Um, he went to drop her off. And he dropped her off at the front door. She got out of the car and he just drove off and left. And she was like, uh, okay, I wasn't expecting that. Went in her house, locked up, did all the things. And he called her the next day. And he's like, what happened? She was, you left. And he said, well, I was just going around the street to park. I just dropped you off because it was raining. I was trying to be really considerate of you. And she was like, oh, I totally. And then she started going, oh, I must, I must have misunderstood. Right. I must have misunderstood. Okay. Well, so then they kept dating and then they spent like two years ago and guess why she broke up with him because he didn't communicate clearly. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of the things she needed, but she kept saying, Oh, it must've been my fault. I must not have heard it right. Oh, it must be my fault because, Oh, okay. He was trying to be gentlemanly, but there was no communication. And so often we also overlook where we're where other people are missing the traits that we need because we keep thinking oh well maybe oh well maybe so as we're dating people instead of asking some of the typical questions like oh so where are you from i mean not that you know we can do small talk if you want but how about asking questions around things that you need Tell me about your family. Tell me about your passion. What's your favorite place? Like if travel's big for you, tell me about your passions. Have you traveled a lot? Where's your favorite place to travel? Because not only do you start getting a more real connection right away, but you can immediately start evaluating as well. Do they have what I actually need to be a long-term partner? And if they don't, if you're like travel is like the num like one of the top five traits I need is someone that's explorative and needs to travel. And they're like, I hate traveling. I just want to stay at home. I've never left the Minnesota or I've never left my state or whatever. You can be like, oh, okay, that's great. Doesn't mean you have to be rude and be like, oh, you're out. Bye. You know, that's not and then you get to say it right away at the end of the date. Like this was really lovely. I don't think this is good. This is not going to work for me. And what that does, see, when we start looking at dating in this way, everything's more of a test. It's not about, am I good enough for them? If I spill my water in their lap and they start making fun of me, I'm like, cool. They don't have any loving consideration. They're out. It's not about, oh my God, I'm so dumb. I can't believe I dropped that water in his lap. Oh my goodness. Like, I'm so embarrassed. I hope he dates me again. No, he made fun of me. That's not loving consideration, right? So it brings this whole new attitude to dating where if someone's rude to you, they're dismissive, they're judgmental. You get to go like, whew, Thank goodness I only had to do one date with that one, <laughs> right? And you get to walk away with confidence in yourself because you know what you're looking for. Now remember that they are also looking for these traits. They're also looking for a good person will also be looking for loving consideration. So how are you treating them? 
This is another error I see in, in the dating world. Someone's like, oh, I want someone that's super kind and respectful and genuine and returns my calls on time, but then they don't do it for the other person, right? They're expecting all these things, but they're not reciprocating. So also look at when you write down those traits, when you write down how people, how you can see that people are giving you loving consideration, are you doing that back? Now we could get into like love languages and sure some people receive love with time and some with active service and some with gifts. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm like, what I'm talking about is do they treat you and others in a way a good human being should? Now when we're dating, when we're online, we can see, okay, do that. We start looking, do they have these traits that I need? Okay, if it seems like they do, let's jump on a call right away. So of texting back and forth, let's create some deeper connection. Let's get into, okay, so then the call goes well. Let's meet each other right away. Because really what you're doing is you're evaluating how close do the traits to these have, this person have. So of texting back and forth for a month and getting ghosted or getting bored or forgetting which one you're texting because you know often when people are online dating they're talking to two or three or 15 people at a time depending upon you know who we're working with here so first you're evaluating the traits then you're evaluating if they have all the traits then you're evaluating what's the level of love and consideration that they have is it a 10 like are you like i'm super impressed with the way they treat me and with the way they treat others and then we look at what's the chemistry and here's the trick when I teach the learning to find love course I tell people usually the person that you end up with as a long-term partner will not be a 10 in chemistry when you first meet them they're usually more like a six or a seven and we're building up something deeper which flies in the face of this whole Hollywood model of you have to have the sexual attraction first. Because sexual attraction, long-term chemistry gets built over time. Remember our attachment hormones? You get that oxytocin, you get that vasopressin, you get those long-term bonds. that create something more sustainable. Does that make things seem a little easier? Like, is that, is what I'm saying clear? Yeah. Yeah, it's a different way of looking at it, That's isn't it? Kind of freeing, you have to have the chemistry be the first thing. Yeah. 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 In fact, there's a woman in my business networking group who stood up, she's getting, she just got engaged to her boyfriend. She's like, yeah. We were friends for years. And I was like, oh my God, I would never date that guy. <laughs> they were like in <laughs> hockey, like she was in female hockey. He was in male hockey. And so all the hockey players would hang out and they would just like hang around each other and they'd see each other at things. And she's like, I would never date him. Then she started realizing that, oh, he's got kind of all the things that I need. And then they started dating. Wow. How often do you hear about these people that at first were just friends and then they became something more? right? So it's not just that friendship needs to come first. It's that these traits and these long-term bonds, this level of love and consideration creates more chemistry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And that's not to say that, you know, you should go on a first date, like in your sweatpants and just be like, Hey, do you have your, my traits, you know, like you still want to make good impressions and such. You still want to put your best foot forward because there are, of course, the biomechanical first impressions and things, right? That even beyond traits that sometimes people get triggered by and chances are they're not going to know these things that you know. So you still want to make a good impression. And doesn't it make saying no to somebody easier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now the learning to find love model, the TLC. So this is what I talked about. Traits first, then loving consideration, then chemistry. 
So imagine now that we detach our emotions from our past relationships, from our expectations, from our belief systems. Because I'll tell you what, if you believe that all women out there are bitches or just trying to steal your money, or all men out there are wussies and can't hold emotion, or that whatever it is that you believe, or that I'm in too small of a town, or I'm too old, or I'm too out of shape, or I'm too young, or, oh, I'm between jobs, so I don't have enough money to date, or whatever it is that you believe, you are automatically putting up a wall around a potential relationship. Because that belief system is going to contain so much energy in you that it's going to push other people away. If you are on guard because you're unhealed from past relationships, people can feel that. People can feel the suspicion. They can feel hesitancy. And it doesn't feel like you're connecting with them. And then they start going, oh, they must not like me. And then they get uncomfortable. Then you get uncomfortable. And then all of a sudden, everyone's uncomfortable. And then the date just doesn't go so well. And you go, oh, God, dating sucks so bad. <laughs> but it's because we're sitting here from a place of, Oh, I hope he's not one of those, or I hope she's not one of those. Instead of doing our healing work around it and coming in with openness and clarity and like, hey, I'm ready. I'm open to the possibility. I'm okay to get hurt. But usually because you're following the system, by the time you're super emotionally bonded, it's going to be a tight connection anyway. So even if, you know, a month down the road, you're like, oh, I thought I saw this trade in them, but it's not as strong as I thought, or maybe it showed up a different way, or maybe I kind of lied to myself and they only had it at a level one instead of a level two, which is where I need it to be. You can still break up with this like beautiful confidence, joy, compassion, empathy, that serves you well, because now you're walking away with integrity and honesty. And also you're not damaging them for their next relationship. Because how crappy is it when we break up with someone in a crappy way and bad mouth them or tell them not that any of you guys would do this, but people do this, right? Even sometimes unintentionally, and we hurt them as we walk away. And now they're broken for the person that they're supposed to be with. So imagine now that we detach that emotion, we find confidence in ourselves. We know that everything is a test. We're just figuring this out. Knowing that when you have those T traits, you're not gonna nag your significant other to be different. You're not gonna try to change them because they are what you need. You're not gonna be taken for granted. You're not going to be put down. You're going to be loved and cherished and appreciated and honored. And that the chemistry is long-term. Even like, of course, every relationship is still going to go through these dips. But everyone I know that's gone through this program, that's gotten married, and there's quite a few of them, like lots and lots and lots. My instructor has been teaching this for years and the one before her taught it for years. They all say that the relationship is so much easier. It's so easy, like almost ridiculously easy because you have these traits. You have this connection. You have this depth, right? So now we get to say no to the person that's not right for us so we can say yes to the person that is right for us. And the faster we can say no in a really honest way without being like, oh, you're not really that cute. I don't know if this is going to work. Right. Or yeah, I guess I'll date you because I don't know if anything better is going to come along. And then two years down the road, you've wasted time, money and energy. Right. So learning to find love is the class that I keep talking about. Um, and I don't know if you've ever heard of John Gray. He's the author of Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. We said is the learning to find love system is a gift to single women and men everywhere. The program provides practical strategies for finding true and lasting love. And this is part of what I've taught you tonight. And I want to just put up 
the QR code for the class, or I, and I'm going to email it out as well later to everybody that's attended. But if you're interested in really doing a deep dive into your healing and really sussing out your traits, we put them in a grid to make sure you know what your top five are. We teach you how to talk about it to other people. So when someone says, oh, you're dating, who do you want to be connected with? Somebody like, well, I kind of want someone that's nice and, you know, someone that, you know, is, is, makes a decent job and hopefully someone that likes to travel. You know, that's not very clear. But if you can say, I'm looking for a man that's super playful and really can take charge of the household, like he's a good communicator and he really does a lot of his own healing work, like that would be a perfect connection for me if you know someone like that. It does not seem much more clear. Mm -hmm. And then people can all of a sudden they start thinking about their coworker or this person they know on Facebook. In fact, one of the girls in the class, not my class, Alina's class, my instructor's class, who's been teaching this for like 15 or 20 years. One of her class, one of her students took this class while she was dating someone else, realized he wasn't the person for her broke up with him. And when he said, why? She said, I realize I need these traits. Told him the traits that he needed. He goes, actually, that sounds like my cousin. Hooked him up with their cousin and like, or I think it was their cousin anyway, but then they ended up getting married, right? So it's like, it was so clear what she wanted. And she was able to do this in a beautiful way that he was like, oh yeah, I totally know someone like that. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. I taught this class a little bit ago. One of the women in my class ran into someone again who she had never really considered dating and then was like, oh my gosh, I didn't even realize that he had all my traits. And now they're feeling things out. They're starting to hang out. They're starting to date to see you know, how it'll go and like to explore that further. So it's interesting how when we don't know what we're looking for, it can be right in front of our face and we don't see it, right? Like looking for the pickles in the fridge, like where are the pickles, where are the pickles? So it's like, they're, they're right here. And you're like, oh, how did I not see that? <laughs> mm -hmm. So I want you to really, whether or not you do the class, I want you to really start playing with these traits for yourself. What do they look like out in the world? How do you see them in someone you're dating? Put that kind of stuff up on your dating profile. I'm looking for someone who's super funny and playful and knows how to communicate. Does that sound like you? Right? So you can actually start sussing out or pre-screening applicants on your dating profile. And then it sets you apart too, because who does that? Right? So are there any questions people want to ask on video? Because otherwise I'll shut off the video and then people can ask questions for those of you that are here live that won't be recorded. Okay. Well, thank you so much for attending. And for those of you watching the replay, there will be emails being sent out. And there's a class link with all the information and if people need payment plans and stuff there's oh there's also a code speed to get a hundred dollars off of the course too so um if any of you are interested feel free to reach out i can all work with anybody with any kind of payment plan and i appreciate you coming and i hope this improves your dating life a lot and helps you find more joy and yeah just joy and ease in the process because we all deserve that mm -hmm. all right Good night.